Before we get going into your Hockey IQ podcast episode, I want to thank our sponsor, Rapid Shot. Rapid Shot is the smart shooting lane. Uh, it's like a batting cage for hockey players. Very cool. Tracks your shot in three ways. Accuracy, shot speed, and reaction time. Uh, easy to use. Uh, actually, I used it when I played and was growing up. Very easy. Simply scan your phone in, select your settings, and start shooting. Uh, you can see your stats on the app and online. And you can check them out at rapidshot.com. Uh, great small business. I actually grew up with one of the owner's sons and have played with all the family members by now. Uh, just in local pickups here in Ohio. Very cool local business. Awesome product. I love it. I know quite a few NHLers have them in their homes. Uh, a lot of D1 programs have it at their rinks. So you have to check this out. Rapidshot.com. Check it out. Rapidshot, thank you so much for sponsoring our podcast. On the Hockey IQ podcast today, we bring on Wade Russell. Wade, long time coming, as we know here. Uh, tell us what you're going, what you got going on today, because I can't keep track of you. Because it seems like uh, you're always doing some good work. Uh, really, really dedicated man over here to learning the skill development side of it, how to be quality, uh, just like a quality person and guiding developing a lot of players uh so i'll let you maybe give us a quick 30 second rundown here uh because yeah. i'm excited to get into it with you because I, I feel like your name's not out there enough no oh, thank you um first of all it's great to be here greg thanks for having me on um quick elevator speech for me um in from london ontario area uh, just up in canada born and raised here kind of played all my hockey here and then just kind of found my way into coaching um under a guy named Dwayne blay who you've had on before who's now a skill development consultant with the detroit red wings so he's kind of been a mentor for me for the last 12 to 13 years, both as, you know, as a person, but as a coach, we learned a lot under him. And we have an academy up here um, that kind of operates in a few different ways that, you know, maybe we'll get into a little bit later, but we work on the ice almost every day with players. We have a gymnasium um, where they're doing their strength and stuff. And then on the side, I'm also doing some assistant coaching with Western University up here um, and recently did my teaching degree, which all has kind of come together very nicely where I'm supplying coaching. Uh, in the mornings, going to supply during the day, and then I'm back at the rink for for kind of some team stuff and then some individual skills out in the community. So that's kind of the elevator speech about me, but I'm sure we'll get into a few more things, but uh, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Awesome. Well, let's just drive right into it because, you know, this is the non-fluff podcast here. What are you currently working on? What's on your mind uh, of things that you're like applying because obviously you, you've got your teaching degree so you you understand the concept that coaching is actually teaching uh so we're, we're already like miles ahead of most people so yep. what, what are you working on yeah so i would say the biggest thing kind of point blank would be i'm really trying to um develop steal share combine um ideas into really transferring constra uh, constraints led approach to the ice and really trying to rewire my brain to avoid just simply doing ABC progressions or regressions and really trying to um, do a much better job of, of taking in the whole of the environment and environmental cues for players and, and trying to use that as our starting point or ending point for the majority of the skill work that we're doing. And a lot of that is inspired by uh, the master's program that I did, um, where I learned a lot about, you know, skill acquisition is the big academic term, but as we all know, it's skill development. Um, and then as well in my teaching degree, doing a little bit more phys ed, there's a big kind of section of, of curriculum where they use teaching games for understanding PGFU is kind of the term. So that's a little bit more kind of popular on, uh, on the education side with physical education and things like that. But that really opened my eyes because I had to coach a grade six volleyball team, which I'd never played much volleyball in my life before, um, when I was doing my teaching practicum. And so I said, you know what? They're grade six. I just want them to enjoy volleyball and keep coming back for years later. I'm just going to teach everything through games. I'm really not going to pull many kids aside and outside of the odd, you know, egregious movement that needs to kind of be corrected. And I just said, you know, we're going to play a ton of games here. So that's kind of where my head's at is pulling from other sports that I think are doing it a little bit better than we are right now. Hockey is, I think, a unique sport for a constraint-led approach. It's very quick, it's very dynamic. You know, outside of maybe face-offs, there are very few plays that happen in complete isolation whereas you know a volleyball serve or a basketball free throw are a lot more isolated um but uh you know it's been it's been awesome it's it's challenging and the biggest thing for me though is it's very empowering to the players when you do it right you can really tell because a lot of them are coming up to you and saying wow that was fun i can't believe that 50 minutes went by so fast because they're just 
they're in the practice, but it feels so much like a game to them in the situation that you're creating for them. Yeah, let's. I think we need to one dive into CLA real quick, and uh, yep. two, I, I just think it's amazing how the more uh, people learn, especially at the top of the game, like even think about Adam Nicholas a little bit, or uh, other other guys like Dwayne and yourself. Like everyone's kind of going away from technique work. It's yep. less and less of a focus on technique. So you know now, uh, I think the top guys of the game are really rolling their eyes whenever they see like three lines at the end of a rink and guys going through objects and well, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see that happen. And uh, a lot of it has to do with the idea of perception action and that loop between you got to be able to see it, be able to apply things uh, going through that learning process of not decoupling perception and pressure from yeah okay, now I need to take an action. What is the correct action given the situation, given the pressure, et cetera? So that's the first thing. The second one is the CLA, as you call it, the constraints led approach. Uh, you, you, you're more academic than I am, so I'll let you uh, break that down as simply as possible for our listeners here who may have no idea what the hell we're talking yeah. about. Yeah, no, and it's it, it, that's a great point in and of itself because I do think – one of the biggest issues that we're facing right now on the hockey side is, is on both sides. I think probably there could be a little bit more willingness to learn and be a little bit uncomfortable with the language and certain things. But at the other side, I do think academia does no favors in, in really actually distilling it to more simplistic principles. So I'm going to do my best today. This is one of the biggest reasons I'm excited to jump on here with you. I think the more that I can try to explain it as, as, as basically as possible, I think the more coaches we can get to buy in. Because when you really understand it, just from, again, a principle standpoint and the basics, it really is just, to me, at least a light bulb goes off in your head where you're like, oh, a lot of it, I always say to coaches, you're already doing. You just are kind of blindly throwing the dart to the dartboard. If we can get you to kind of hone in that bullseye a little bit more, you're just going to benefit the players even more. So it's rooted in big fancy term, ecological dynamics and dynamical systems theories. Throw all the words out. What that means is we are humans. And we have learned to evolve in a world that is constantly taking in our surroundings and our environment. Um, and this information, environmental cues, you'll hear people talk about, but really it comes down to kind of constraints and affordances. So constraints, there are individual constraints, your height, your weight, your flexibility. Those are individual constraints inherent to you. There are task constraints. Okay. So a red light when you're driving is a task constraint. You could go through the red light but you understand the task at hand, you need to stop and wait for it to go green before you can go. Uh, and then environmental constraints. So the example I always use for that, there's kind of two, if you walk up to a puddle today on the sidewalk, you have a nice, great new pair of white shoes and that puddle's there, you've never taken a puddle jumping class. No human in their life has ever taken a puddle jumping class, but you somehow know how to spot out the shallow part and you are gonna tiptoe and navigate your through it navigate your way through it to minimize kind of the, the damage done to your shoes so if you think of it as kind of a triangle there are task constraints individual constraints and environmental constraints and these are things that are just ever present in your environment as a human being but as we kind of start to shift it towards hockey these constraints are the boards and the glass and and the zone size obviously the net offside those are kind of task constraints as well um, and then your individual constraints can also be kind of your skill set so that's why it is important I'm not big on throwing out completely technique right out the window. There is a time and a place for it. Um, but it's important that at the end of the day, when we talk about making players who are strong at adapting the skills from practice to the game, it comes down to using and manipulating some of these constraints to point them in the direction of a movement solution. Again, starting to get back into fancier terms, also kind of called affordances. To me, these are just opportunities or not to me. The research says these are opportunities for action. So where you position other players in a drill, where you start them from, maybe one or two of the rules you give them, and then the overlying environmental constraints of the boards and the space will hopefully promote them to, to find opportunities for action with this environment. And guess what that means? It means mistakes. It means things that you might not necessarily do yourself as a coach. It means falling down. It means turning over pucks. But across time and with opportunities, it is constantly allowing players to be in the game environment far more than free 
scripted drills that are just checking boxes, A, B, C, back of line. Um, so that hopefully dive in more with me, but that's kind of how I would slowly ease into it as far as coaching goes. All right. And then I'm going to try to distill this even further because uh, I think you made it clear enough. Um, basically, the constraints led approach is understanding there's an environment with cues. Players need to understand those cues. So we should be creating activities that have those types of cues um, and adding constraints to encourage certain types of solution finding rather than the solutions themselves. Correct. All right. Yeah. Cool. Now we can dive in. So yeah. maybe what are some examples of constraints you've used to teach, influence, and inform skill development? Yeah. So I just tried one the other day. Again, I still do very simple things on the ice as well. I'm not, by any means, I'm still constantly learning, trying, making mistakes, tripping over myself. But one, you know, we, we struggle a lot with where we get brought out to an ice time of 30 to 35 kids and only one coach wants to come out and help. And half the time they want to drink their coffee and just kind of lean on the boards. Right. So we have two staff out there, 35 kids. How can we provide the most value to them while still kind of picking the quantity box, right? Where we want quality, but at the end of the day, we got 35 bodies out there. So we still need to have some just math quantity and getting them touches. So say we're doing passing and I have, you know, 16 kids in one end. It was the other day, had them paired up in pairs of two, just passing back and forth. They were young. They didn't need, they needed to learn how to present a target, how to maybe cradle a little bit and smack it on their backhand. So we did a bit of this partner passing kind of for the dot lines just to introduce it. And I said, you know, how can I, on mass, get them to think a little bit more about finding lanes as the passer, but even more, how can I point the player off the puck to get open a little bit without adding too much movement and too much kind of chaos for the, the young players. And so what I did is I went right down the middle of them and I sprinkled a bucket of pucks everywhere. And I basically just made kind of all of this mass junk all between them and their partner. And so what they had to do without me saying anything, I said, okay, keep passing. I didn't give them any further instruction to start with. And you started to see the puck carrier was kind of moving their body a little bit to try to find and align their stick and maybe their body with a bit of a lane to get that puck through. I brought the kids in after a little bit and I'm, I'm a big believer in asking questions first. And I said, you know, what's unique about passing? Is it a skill where it's just you or is it kind of a two-way skill? And then they kind of go, oh, it's a two-way skill because you're, you're sharing and giving a puck with another player. And I said, well, what can the player that doesn't have the puck do to maybe make it easier for them to receive the puck? And some of them have played a bit of basketball, a bit of soccer, and they start talking about getting open. So just by asking a question, I said, okay, let's go try that. They go back to their little spots, pucks again, everywhere down between them. And then you actually start to see players kind of shifting and moving and getting open for one another. And then with time, they actually started actually calling for pucks. And I didn't even have to instruct all these things. Whereas normally, I'd be out of breath by now. I'd be sweating. My voice would be hoarse. Could I be just bringing them in, giving them information, bringing them in, giving them information. But in this way, I was able to provide a lot of quantity. They got a lot of touches and a lot of reps. But just a little constraint of creating gaps of loose pucks with eight-year-olds allowed them the affordance to kind of look at lanes and scanning and some of these things that we kind of talk about at a higher level. So that was an example just the other day. That's that's fantastic. Uh, in similar vein, whenever I'm trying to work on some passing and understanding that passing is a two-person activity, like some, someone's actually got to move to get open, like that's probably more important. Uh, it's the movement to make the passing possible. Like I will do a single zone or a half ice, whatever, just constrain the space, make it smaller and pair off just like you did. And players have to always pass between another pair. So like they have nice. to scan to figure out, okay, where are the other pairs at and always changing the pair. So the, the constraint on that is, okay, everyone come in. All right. Pair off. It happens in two seconds. Yeah. Okay. What you're going to do here is you're going to make passes, but you have to pass between folks. Like it always has to be between a new pair each yeah. time. And then boom, you suddenly see the movement going or even the passers moving now to like find a new lane. So they're trying yeah. to create all this stuff. Uh, and you're exactly right. Like you don't have to instruct movement. They now have to snap passes. Uh, yeah. you know, like it's a very rich environment for seeing other folks move. While it may not be a hundred percent game realistic, uh, it really is not game realistic. <laughs> yeah. And I think to me, you made a great point earlier. I believe you said, I don't, I don't think it was before when we were chatting, but I believe 
you said perception action. And, and so this is basically a secular process where we perceive and then we act based on these constraints and these affordances. So um, again, very basic example, doors, right? Without it saying push or pull, some doors have it listed, but you generally know what door is a push door and what door is a pull door, right? Just based on the handle. If it's that sl uh, kind of slate of metal, you push. If it has a bit of a handle coming off the door, you pull. So that we perceive and then we act. That drill that you just described right there, we're coupling things that are kind of happening in the game. We're seeing space between players. We're not seeing the constraints that the players actually are as far as where they are, but we're teaching players to see in between them. So that's why it's such a, a, a cool approach because we could have taken my you know, scrambled puck passing, very, very basic stationary drill. And then the next level is we go right into your drill there, where now it's not just passing through stationary objects and just making good passes. It's, you know, a little bit more movement. It's finding space between. It's really getting open, right? Even you can add a little bit of disruption, but the guys that aren't involved and the girls that aren't involved, but it's, to me, it's, it's such an empowering approach because it really allows you to step back, observe, and provide far more meaningful feedback to each individual rather than just slapsticking, you know, one bullet point to everybody. You can pull little Jimmy or little Susan aside and give them one or two pointers. They jump back in and you haven't disrupted the drill at all. You haven't had kids stand around and wait for one instruction, right? So it's, 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 it's a really cool approach. Yeah, it's, yeah, this in general, the idea that we're talking about is really cool because it, it allows you to do a lot of things while coaching without disrupting. Uh, just really cool like for example like I, I love doing the rondo so it's the monkey in the middle yep. he's got yeah and just to, for the basics so you can make it more complex and you can add movement but just basic concept here is you got five people around the outside of the circle two yep. people in the middle uh two people in the middle are trying to get the puck five people on the outside of the circle trying to keep it just like being able to pull one player out drill still working oh hey look, just you know, keep losing the puck you know, what's going on what are some ways maybe you can fool the opponent oh and then okay and then they start talking about deception and slip passes and all of that stuff and it's the same idea and you know, that could be even another level of complexity right because like you're always trying to right match complexity with where the players are at like you don't want to make it too hard you don't want to make it too easy well yep. sometimes you want to make it too easy sometimes you'll make it too hard but that's a story for, sure. for another day probably yep. uh just mentally how do we want to handle the players <laughs> Yeah, but absolutely. yeah, it's, it's that concept of just adding constraints, adding these activities that influence the players. Like, are the players are almost influencing themselves because they're finding the solutions, which I think is the, the powerful concept there. Do you have any other uh, examples? Uh, I'm trying to think of my own, but I'm, I'm really terrible at this. Uh, just pulling them off the top of my head, but you, you mentioned it, and I'm like, boom, there's a connection. I got, I got one. Yeah, no, of course. So. Another one that I, again, I'm all these things I'm trying, I'm just trying. So the other day I kind of tried one where, again, a little bit of a technique approach to start. We, we put, you know, X number of cones across a goal line and a blue line in the same zone. So say it's four cones across there. Those are our lines that players line up behind and they're looking inward into the zone at one another. So they're looking both towards the tops of the circles, trying to make this as clear as possible for, for our listeners. Um, so then there would be another set of four corresponding cones along kind of the midline between the two. So you end in total, say you have 16 cones, four, four, and four. And basically these players end up sharing the cone in the middle and they're just transitioning. They're just working on their pivots and a bit, a bit of movement and kind of feeling things out. And I said, you know, this is great. They're, they're moving better, but how can I get them to perceive and act and actually transition or not transition and go toes forwards on an angle uh, in a bit of a one-on-one -on -one situation? How can I get them to just explore that without me over-instructing? And so what I did was I took the middle cone that they had been sharing and I actually slid it down to the goal line. So now there were two cones down there that made a goal for each grouping. And so what I did was I put a player now up by the blue line and I put one player that's in between that starts inside the goal on the goal line. And all that player did that starts in the goal is they skate a puck up a couple of strides and they pass all the way up to the player on the blue line. And that player's blue line only, I gave them one task and constraint. And I said, you need to skate the puck past that player and skate through the goal on the goal line. So you need to earn that ice. You're not trying to score a goal, as we know in hockey. You're just trying to score by skating and earning that ice. And I said to the player coming up and giving the pass, the one that's you know supposed to hopefully transition or angle, I said, you're just supposed to stop them. And so at the beginning, almost every single kid did what most kids do in one-on-ones. They charged right at them and went for the big kind of Hail Mary stick swing. And just said, ah, and then tried to charge at them, right? Knock the puck away. Uh, and every time the player blew past them and, 
And over time, you know, you, I just let it happen. Normally, this is where, you know, the coach in you wants to bubble with and go, hey, you know, you got to do this and do it exactly like this and just do that over and over again. But I said, you know what, I'm going to sit back a little bit. I'm going to observe a bit more. And then I'm going to kind of just go around one by one on all the players and ask them questions about why they handled it the way that they did or what they could have done differently. And with time, you started to see, A, players got up in the plate quicker. They started to realize I can't, you know, kind of dilly dally from the goal line, give a bad pass, and then hope to get my feet set in time. They got up there quick, gave a really good pass. And then they started to explore, okay, you know, I can flip my feet and poke check. Some players were a little more comfortable with that. Other ones kind of bellied out a little bit and took a bit more ice and angled, especially it was unique. The players that had the drill kind of structured more towards the boards where they happened to be actually started to use the boards a little bit more for an angle. And none of these things were things that I explicitly pointed at and said, this is what you need to do. They were just things that had come up through questioning and conversation and other things that the drill just kind of slowly nudged the player into doing. If that yes. makes sense. Yes, I, I love that. Um, I do a lot of angling, so I think it's an underdeveloped area. Uh, so actually, I wrote on this in the Hockey IQ newsletter of like my behind-the-scenes practice for physical contact, like a rising group into body checking. Loved it. Yep. And yeah, like that was the whole idea was I want to put them in environments where there, I mean, there are some technical stuff. So like I want to you know, stick on puck, you got to get under get good body positioning. So there was like the basic level, but then beyond that, which was early, was putting environments that were slightly looked slightly different, but mm -hmm. angling, initiating contact, getting inside of hands, all of that. Um, and I think from a spacing standpoint, if we, we have the whole rink, we've got two goalies on both sides. We've got skaters uh, without pucks on the dots facing more of the ice, so in the middle of the neutral zone, and then skaters with pucks on the far blue line. And all of this is simple. Okay, you can't skate backwards. Figure it out. And just letting it go. Um, yep. And if there's something that's like, oof, that was rough, uh, maybe I should go ask a question to that kid, or maybe I should be like pointing out to some players in lines. What, what if you took your puck and you skated directly at that person rather than just going straight down the wall? Or uh, sometimes, like, just in general, like, the group maybe isn't there or isn't seeing it. Just I literally, like, bring them in, being like, okay, so where does the defenseman want you to go? You know, they're all sheepish at first because no one's ever yeah. had this approach from a coach mostly uh, at this point. Hopefully this changes. Yeah. Uh, but after the fact, they're like, well, down the wall, it's the outside away from the net. Yes. So if you're an offenseman, should that be your first move? And then you start seeing light bulbs go off. No, it, sh it really shouldn't. Maybe I should <laughs> go elsewhere. Yeah. That's like, yeah. Awesome. So like, what if you like went to the middle first or, you know, skated at the defenseman? What do you guys think about that? Yeah, it'd be great. Blah, blah, blah. All right. So they go back and they start doing it. At first, at first, the you know, as you're going through this progression, that, angler always has the advantage and then you start to see like well okay how do i undo that and you start to see players figuring it out now players on the angling now they're starting to go deeper in their angles so the angling is actually getting better and it's like this loop where you can see the failures happening and it's everywhere but the learnings are happening so fast it's super tangible for a coach and if any coach listening wants this uh happy to provide but wait yeah. I, I bet you've got something similar whether it be angling or other where you're just like you could see the light bulbs go on so fast and i'll pull that thing out of almost any group and it, it yeah like clockwork it works so one thing we love doing is is we do we do do one-on-ones because they do happen quite a bit across the hockey game but what we find with younger players is that you know the one-on-one -on -one is far too extended it becomes a game of keep away a lot of the times rather than a game of you know maintain possession and look for another play so what I'm getting at here is we're, we're just trying to get them to make moves and things like that, which is great, but a lot of them will they'll circle away and then they'll circle away and then they'll circle away. And by now you, the coach in you wants to go up and say, Hey, a one-on-one -on -one does not last that long, right? It's one little move. And then you got to move your feet and get by or get through into that space. And so one of my favorite things to do to kind of get a light bulb to go off in a player's head, and this is a good example of 
it's so important just looking at everything as information that you're trying to give the player to point them in the right direction. So now, however, the one-on-one -on -one drill kind of starts and gets into the meat and the, the heart of the one-on-one, -on -one, I'll just release one more player and I'll say, you're back checking and you're going to help the defender. And I won't tell the offensive player in that set that that's coming. So all of a sudden they'll cut back for the third time and then they throw their hands up because they're like, hey, where did he come from? That's not fair. And then you kind of start to ask the questions. Well, in a game, how many players are on the ice? And you start to get them thinking about the larger game outside of the drill. Because sometimes it is too much to, you know, have five on five and, and be teaching within that. So you're trying to find, you know, the sample size of the game that you need to present to them to give them the information that they need. So that's one of my favorite ones because you'll get the kid that's really, really good at one-on-one -on -one keep away and he can keep the puck forever, but he never gets to the net and they never get to the net and shoot. And just by letting one back checker go and surprise them and poke them, the next rep, they have such a greater sense of urgency and, and such a greater sense of understanding of making a move, making a play, but that they still need to kind of be aware of some of these other threats that will be coming in pretty quickly after the, the first contact. I love that. Uh, I, I know there's plenty of coaches out there that struggle with their players having a sense of urgency. Just, you know, add another player, a little back checker. Like, you know, a little, a little, the urgency will sort itself right out. You don't need to, like, harp on urgency, putting a stopwatch out. Like, you need to do this within this amount of time. Click. Like, no, no, yeah. just add something that might happen in a game where urgency is required. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Surprise. Yeah, surprise. There you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's fascinating. Uh, I like a little chaos too. I don't know about you. I, I think chaos yeah. is extremely important. I've got trills where maybe it's less CLA ish and more just straight up chaos. And uh, I call it developing responsibility because I find that oh, I'll just grab a new puck in practice. And as we all know, yeah. that is not how it works in the game. Like you've got to value the puck a little, value mm -hmm. your responsibility as sure. puck hair. Um, so one, one of my favorite activities is, uh, eight lines total. So four lines, both sides of the dot line, you pass, you fill the back of that line. My only caveat I have with that is you cannot do the line directly across from you. So that's, you know, they got to switch. So I start four pucks on one side of the ice. You can't do the one right, right across from you. All right. First person is aggressive. They throw the pass. Boom. Okay, well, another person was like, oh, that was my line. Where do I got to go? So now they're starting to scan and look. So now they're looking, and inevitably, inevitably, every single time, I don't, I don't care what age, I don't care what skill level, AAA, single, house league, don't matter. Inevitably, a line just randomly disappears. Or there's a puck that will go, we go from four pucks down to like two. And it's a perfect opportunity to uh, teach. Yeah. What happened? Why is this happening? Like, this is your puck until it's not your puck. And, yeah. and just seeing doing that drill, maybe like three practices total, and how it changes. The lines never, uh, you know, suddenly disappear. You know, they're bitching at each other to make sure that they're doing things right. So now you're getting like accountability and positive peer pressures, I call it. Like, peer pressure, but not in the fashion that everyone thinks of like, oh, peer pressure and you're doing terrible things. No, it's not yep. very good light. So I love doing drills like that where it's like there's constraints around it. It's an activity um, that requires a little bit of chaos. Yeah, it's it's so important and it's so important. And I understand there's you got to be practical and safe with certain things. Like you never want collisions and things like that. But one that I love to run is, you know, you, you, you pick your constraint in terms of space based on your numbers. It can be between both blue lines, just in the neutral zone. It can be more red line in if you need more kind of half the ice, however you want to divvy it up. And I'll often kind of go through a progression with it. So everybody's got a puck just freewheeling around, eyes up, scanning. Um, second uh, level is everybody's got a puck freewheeling around, swatting at other people's pucks. So trying to have a disruptive offensive stick while still managing your puck. And other constraints you can have is, you know, you're you're only allowed to cross your feet. You're only allowed to use Crosby's. You're only allowed to shuffle skate. Like you can add in kind of movement constraints if you want to get them kind of performing these skills in different ways. But one of my third and final favorite ones is I'll level it up to five, six, whatever my number is of players, they shoot their pucks out of the playing space and they're sharks now. So they have to skate around and steal pucks from anybody they want. And if they steal your puck, you can steal yours back or you can go pursue somebody else's. So in the kind of little drill that we have, we'll always have four to five to six players without a puck. 
and it's total chaos because people are being chased. They're starting to understand they need to look behind them because they're fearful of losing their puck, but then they forget and remember they need to look in front of them because they still got to know where they're going. And then the players that are still puck focused because they're trying to steal, they realize that they still need to scan, even though they're the one hunting the puck, they still need to be aware of what's going on around them so that as they do get possession, that they're prepared. And it's total chaos, three or four collisions. But I, I always pull them in. I ask them, them a question. I'm like, what did that feel like? Like, what did that chaos? Like, was that crazy? And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, what did that feel like? And they're like, a game. And I'm like, well, there you go. That's why we do those things. We want you to feel like you're in a game. We want you to, you know, have the permission to make mistakes, but also the understanding that you're you're trying to learn from what's going on. How many of you, you know, tried something and then it didn't work and then you tried something different and they'll throw their hands up and I say, that's what we want. We want you to explore. We want you to try I always say try, feel, apply. I want my sessions to go in an order where they're trying things, maybe a little more technical movement focused, right? Or sorry, feel, try, apply. So they're feeling things, right? Giving them internal cues, trying. They're trying it out a little bit more contextually and then applying where it's, I'm going to give you the environment. Can you pick up on the cues, the reads and, and, and do those things? So that's kind of starting the basic level, which is a bit of keep away. But then we build it into, can you hunt the puck, steal it and make a pass low to high out of the corner eventually? Right. And that's kind of. Yeah, that stuff's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And and I love where like you have to do like two activities at once in your head. You got to keep your own and then you got to go steal. Uh, same idea of like using multiple pucks in activities. Um, and that whole progression that you can do with that. Uh, super powerful. A uh, lot of examples there. I think we can continue going for an entire episode, but yep. I want to keep, keep us moving a little bit here. Um, for sure. The, the one thing that we've talked about uh, quite a bit here is uh, question asking. And and I think the biggest thing holding back from coaches are being really good question askers um, is just the mindset. And I think the mindset is that buckets, like players are buckets that need to be filled. And I think that's not the way we should be thinking about this. It should be more about like, okay, they're human beings. Uh, kids are a lot smarter than we get some credit for. They're very observational. We should be able to pull answers from them and okay if they're really struggling we can step in and maybe give them some ideas still not giving them the answer but stimulating the reflection and the searching for answers like it's so important in ourselves like you think about any kind of thing that you improve at there's a bit of self-reflection and self-actualization of like what's going on what do i need to do what are my personal limitations and what can I find that works best for me? I, I think that when I introduce that to fellow coaches, like there's the light bulb moment for them is like players are not buckets that we have to fill. Yeah, you have a lot of thoughts on this. <laughs> yeah. Like, and it's such a good point. And this is where the reason I've just become kind of a, a bigger proponent proponent of the constraint led approach is because it affords me more opportunities to do just that, to, to question, to prod, to explore with players. Whereas before, you know, I was consumed by the way the drill worked, the way that it functioned, because I thought players were getting a lot out of it by doing it the right way and making sure the lines neat and tidy and organized and, you know, kind of micromanaging the point that I never actually did much coaching. It was just constant instruction, which are two, two different things in my mind. Um, so when it comes to kind of questioning, as, as I've kind of come to understand it, I think there's tons of value for it at all ages. Um, there, there's a lot of interesting research on it as an instructional method for kind of more elite learners. It really suits them well, because by then they've, and not, I shouldn't say elite learners, like elite players, because everybody's kind of an elite learner, really, if you're, if you're providing them the right information. Um, but what it does so well is it it allows them, they have a good skill set. When you're working with an elite player, like there's a reason why they're elite and at that level, whether it's junior, major, junior, semi-professional or, or, or higher level pro. But it's if you're getting them to explore the space, they need to seek out the information themselves, right? It, it isn't as a it isn't black or white. It isn't you know just do this because that's the right play. We could watch 17 wall sequences, and neither one is the exact same as the last one. So questioning, I think, is it, such a a great instructional method because it, it gets the player, as you said, to reflect. How many players just go to the back of line, take kennel the puck, think about the hot dog that they're going to have on their way home from the rink? And then jump back in the drill and they blink and they're done drill again without any of that reflection in there. So by getting them to reflect, we're definitely teaching them to do that. And then I love using analogies as well. So they're really good for intermediate learners um, because sometimes they have the skill or the competency necessary 
to improve in your sport or in your domain, but it kind of for them exists right now in another sport. So a player might be a really good baseball player and they swing a bat really well and shift their weight. And so by asking them, you know, hey, I want you to step like you're, you're swinging a baseball bat when you shoot a hockey puck, say they're a righty and they swing uh, right. So that's a really good opportunity to kind of use analogies. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to stay away from giving them explicit information of how to's and we're not trying to limit them. We're trying to, again, promote them to explore and have a lot of different opportunities for action. Love that. Um, and I, I think another component to this that we're kind of talking about is like creating <laughs> activities and drills where it's coachless. Uh, there are some activities you want to do and I, I get to figure out how to like totally remove myself. Yep. Uh, but I'm definitely not like making the pass. I will never have an activity that does that. Just finding ways that I'm actually flexing my true coaching skills, not just what you talked about with giving instruction and managing the drill. Like it's less about managing the drill and more about managing the people within the activity and, yeah. uh, and observing, tinkering, et cetera. And I think the more that we think about and implement coachless drills, it takes care of a lot of these things. So that's what I always challenge coaches to do when I'm doing my coach developing is asking, you know, how can we do ways where we just like remove ourselves completely? Yep. A lot it's, of times it's, it's, yeah, go for it. No, no, sorry. It's, uh, it is tricky, right? Like, cause you, you just catch yourself with the whistle in your mouth again and, and you're trying to take over one of the, just to throw it kind of another way to, again, look at constraints and to challenge coaches and kind of think about how they do things. I ended up trying this and I ended up really liking it just because of what I saw out of the players without having to, to do much instruction myself. I kind of created a download drill. It started out, I think, as a two on two, but eventually we built up into a three on three. Started with a rim. So puck comes down the wall. The two net front players leave the net. One has possession or gets the first touch. Other one's kind of defending. So a little bit of a loose puck retrieval to start the drill. And then there's an offensive unit and a defensive unit. And I added uh, different weightings to different kind of outcomes. So you know, if you were to able to generate a shot as the offensive group immediately kind of low to high within the first five, that was worth X amount of points. Any other shot on goal was a little bit less, but still worth points. And then, of course, a goal was kind of the highest amount. So those were the offensive weightings. And then the defensive ones um, were about, you know, if you can chip it past the ring at line, so if you can kind of bypass one of the forwards and get it up to our wingers in the game theory, right? If we can chip it out, that was a certain amount of points. If we can skate it out, that's a certain amount of points. And then worst case, we have nothing if you can freeze it. That's a certain amount of points. Can you just get it on the wall and hold it there for a second or two? And again, in game theory, can we get our, our team to kind of come and support? And so I didn't say about how to achieve any of this. I just said, you know, here's how you can earn points. I wrote it on the glass. They would kind of circle by when they weren't playing to kind of review. And over time, you could literally see the players processing in real time. Not just constant reaction, but actually kind of a risk analysis or a cost-benefit analysis of, you know, do I have the room to skate the tier or should I chip it? And sometimes it cost them. They thought for so long that they ended up turning the puck over, but I was getting them to think about, you know, managing the puck in your own end as a defense kind of group. And then as the offensive group, we kind of saw a little bit more quick strike offense. We saw way more um, interest in recovering loose puck because they, they just wanted to get their points. They didn't actually care about scoring anymore, which was kind of a breath. Of, of fresh air for me. They weren't just worried about scoring goals. They were worried about generating chances because there was a lot of value there. But going back to your point, in a lot of ways, I was teaching them to play the way that I kind of wanted them to, at least for that age and for where they were at their skill levels. And I didn't have to say a word. I just drew the kind of weightings on the glass. I went and let them play three on three down low, but it had a lot more purpose to it. It wasn't just, you know, a small area game to play a small area game. I really wanted them to process and, and think about the risk and the value of, of different things they wanted to try. And you could see that with time, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. They're seeing the risk reward and then they're being encouraged for good quality plays with more points. Um, and I think that's the key is like the encouragement. Yep. I always see like, okay, we want to encourage more passing in our team. How do we do about do that? And I do this probably every time I do coach developing seminars and, inevitably someone says some fashion of like, all right, we're doing three on three cross sites and you're required to make three passes before shooting. And I'm over here. I'm like, you mind if I disagree with you for a second? And I'm like, oh, yeah, go for it. Whatever. Blah, blah, blah. Some grumble. Some are like, yes. Okay. I can get away from this and there might be a better answer. Give, give me all the information you want. And 
I'm always like, so what if we, instead of requiring things, we encourage and incentive things. So for example, you get a point added to each goal. So a goal is always worth one or two points, whatever you want. So I like two because, you know, they're, they're great. Goals are awesome. We, we love yeah. them. We Unless you're goalie. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so every pass you make for that adds one point to the inevitable goal. If you don't score, you don't get it. But I don't want to take a player out of playing the game because they've got to do something else and then go back into playing the game. Like that, I feel like that's the worst. Like you're on a breakaway. Now, okay, now I got to turn around and pass. Okay, well, you did a nice job of stripping and finding, you know, a breakaway here. Uh, take your two points. <laughs> like just yeah. score the goal. It's the uh, right play. Yeah, it makes no sense. It's it's seeing that risk reward playing out and getting them in that idea of like, eh, should I just go for the goal or should I make a pass? Um, and, you know, the way – you kind of get around overpassing is okay. Yeah, you don't get a point if you don't score. So you just have to find the best opportunity to score and then put in the, you know, bank those points. Yeah. Uh, so I absolutely, absolutely love that. How you're talking about encouraging, incentivizing behavior rather than explicitly giving, just like, okay, here's the points, have fun. And they're going to make plays that, that are most valuable more often than not. Yeah. And it just, it all, again, the one thing I, I really want to sell to anybody listening is it, it all ties together so nicely for you to provide far more meaningful instruction in between the reps and the sets. And so you're, you're still coaching and you're definitely still influencing um, the way that they play and the way that they think, but you're not, you're not overburdening them and you're not over inundating them with useless information, like putting a pylon on the ice and saying, always delay here. You're putting them in a situation that says, hey, I should probably delay here, wherever that here may be. And you can still ask questions like, hey, should you delay right when you get inside the blue line or maybe a little bit lower in the zone? Why, why do you think that might be a little bit better? Like you can still push them towards, depending on what level you're at and how much you know game management does matter to you and things like that. You can still push them towards certain principles of the game of hockey that we probably would all agree are advantageous for the most part. You're just, you're not, wasting your breath is, is the biggest thing it, it ties so nicely with every kid is getting quality and quantity quantity and the amount of touches the reps the amount of movement the amount of uptime quality in terms of they're being provided a variety of affordances and one thing i wanted to kind of go back to your rondos yeah and i know there's a little bit of fervor back and forth about whether they're there i love them just they're easy to get into they can be such a routine that you start your practice with it's going to add more value than most things and then on top of it, we mostly considered it from the keep away aspect. Tell me that that player in the middle isn't going to develop a better defensive stick with time without you ever, ever, ever teaching them that. If you just go in and do rounders the whole season and you focus on the passing and getting it through the lanes and you tell the D that they can, you know, maybe they can't get in a guy, a guy or girl's face, but they're allowed to squat and knock down pucks. They're going to have better defensive sticks by the end of the year without you ever actually even making that a point of the drill. So to me, there's, there's always a nice coupling. We talk about perception action coupling from movements of what we're focusing on the drill, but there's always a coupling on the other end of it that you're not even getting to. Just like muscles, there's an agonist and an antagonist, right? There's always that inside of a drill as well that you're not even instructing now that is still getting a lot of value out of it, right? That, I go back to my one-on-one -on -one drill where I tried with the gates. I never even talked to the offensive player. The drill was completely about getting them to understand when to transition versus when to angle with post forward. But those players offensively would have been learning because now that feedback that they were receiving on the defensive side was changing. They were changing what they were doing as well. So it, 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 it's such a good blend of what all the players need from quality to quantity and then allows us as coaches to provide meaningful instruction in between. Yes. Um, and I'll also, going with the coachless drills, want to add one more thing before we move on here of like challenging all coaches uh, to just get rid of your whiteboard. Just, just, let it go. Uh, shoot a puck at it, break it in half uh, over your knee. Whatever you need to do, just get rid of your whiteboard. I, I promise you uh, that you'll be so much happier uh, without it. You will feel so much more empowered. You'll feel a little lost maybe at the beginning, but you will take off with your coaching skills because you've got to find it. It's, it's, it's the same thing we're doing to our players here, and giving affordances and constraints. Like If you can't use a whiteboard, I promise you, you're going to figure out how to better explain and find better activities where it's not do this, then this, then that. 
uh, just putting in environments and, and a little more dramatic. Uh, I still have a whistle, but I blow it, you know, maybe like seven times now during a practice, but just get rid of your whistle. Just don't have a whistle for a practice. Like I'm going to challenge myself, no whistles and see what that does. Uh, and now your players actually have to listen to you. They, they can't screw off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this kid just grew up in a corner. Especially like the whiteboard to me, the hard time I'll use it. I, sometimes I worry, you know, and this is more kind of, for me drawing from the teaching background and, and, and something called universal uh, design of learning. So basically UDL is just about similar how we want to provide an affordance of information in the environment for, for, for kids to learn how to play hockey. You want to provide it in a, a variety of, of resources in the classroom so that every kid kind of got something that they they're drawn to. So sometimes I do worry that, you know, maybe a kid just might understand it a little bit better two dimensionally. The odd drill, if I just think that giving them a bit of time, I'll, I'll draw it. But what I've really, really shied away from myself is I don't go to the board ever to teach, teach. I'll, I'll use the drill that I've created and I'll let two or three or however many kids are involved, involved in it. And I'll tell them to run a repetition. And then based on watching that, I'll ask the group and we'll kind of use that as our, our sample size. Because I can draw up exactly where I can draw up timing on the board and say, hey, you got to be in the high slot on time. And my hands are up now for people listening. Like, what does that mean to be on time? It's completely relative to everything going on around you, right? So that's where I've really gotten rid of the board and, and, and really try to use players. And I think it's so good to let your players demonstrate and to make mistakes during demonstrations. And it is an embarrassing. You, you obviously you need to talk with the group because if you have to drop in group, you'll get one kid that maybe makes a joke. But as a team, I think it's easy to foster an environment of learning and growth. Uh, but I think it's so important to use live demonstration, demonstrations as your, your core source of feedback that you're going to talk about and not just drawing it on the whiteboard because you can always ever make everything look perfect on there. But in a drill, as we all know, in a game, as we all know, nothing is ever the same twice. Nothing is ever perfect twice. Um, timing is it's relative. So we, we can't speak about how to play off the puck um, just dry, by drawing arrows on the board. Yeah, super valuable. Uh, yeah, <sighs> getting rid of it was such a freeing experience after the first like anxiety of going through the practice without it. But then oh, it's it's just a takeoff in how you coach, how your players learn. Fantastic. Uh, within that same vein, I, I think there's a great thing that happens out there uh, to first-time coaches or coaches that are just starting, um, and is that they, they play better than they've ever played in their lives. And how do we tap into that while players are still playing? I think is, is a great concept that we need to dive into more often. Uh, for example, uh, what about if we just have players break down their own clips for their peers or in front of their peers and then just start like a room where they're teaching and there's question asking and now they're like, well, maybe was that really a good option when I broke down this clip? And just getting out of the way, letting them go through that learning, teaching experience uh, I'm assuming that you may have tried this out as well and had some experiences that have been positive. Yeah, I think uh, it, it's so important. Like we actually used to do it. It's so funny. Back in the day, I went to a hockey camp. Was you know an old school hockey camp in the sense of the way the drills and everything worked. But the one thing they did was they would actually film us with like an old school camcorder, and then uh, they would somehow burn it onto a VHS tape, and they would put it in the old school TV that they'd wheel in when you had a you know a substitute teacher that day, right? And, and we would watch film and, and we, the coach wouldn't break down the film. Kids would just chat about it. And again, it was us going through a drill. So there are things that you can now do to, to make it so much better. But it was actually pretty cool at the time because part of hockey camp was you just be sitting there with like 20 of your, 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 your friends and, and peers and you'd just be talking hockey in a, like a, a grade six level. So whatever that sounded like, right? Like, but it was, it was really cool. Just like we're, we're chatting hockey and um what even I've started to do working a little bit with, with our power play at Western and stuff is I actually heard this first completely soul kind of idea, but it makes so much sense. Um, a few players I, I know in, in kind of in the summer had mentioned Andre Trigny with, with Arizona, Arizona Coyotes. One of the biggest things is he gets mad if they're doing video and nobody's talking. He wants it to be a conversation. He wants it to be a group effort. You know, he understands fully that you're the ones that are on the ice. You're the ones that are making the reads. You're the ones that are seeing things. Don't let me tell you how to do absolutely everything. I can suggest certain things. I can instill certain things, right? And the players love that. Like they, to have a voice, first of all, any autonomy that you can provide players is always going to empower them um, in such a good way. And then on top of that, 
it goes almost back to what you'd said about reflecting in the middle of drills, like getting, you know, the, the and if we want to improve hockey IQ in any capacity, you got to think hockey, you got to be thinking about it. You got to be exploring ideas in your head. Just like if you want to become an expert in any subject, you've got to be mulling and toying with ideas and, and drawing from alternative concepts. Right. And these all sound like big things, but in hockey, there's, there's no resource left untapped, right? We hear about the stories of Crosby getting better at one skill in the summer. Um, you hear stories about players seeking out. I'd heard a story this summer as well of Kutrov and Stamkos working on missed power play shots from the flanks and how, which pane of glass you hit where that puck would squirt to. And so they knew as the flank, depending on where it hit off the back of the glass, where it'd be popping to on their flank side when the one was shooting to the other. Again, crazy stories, but it all comes back to like, they're just exploring the game and, and what these different things that happen within it may produce and how to take them into the advantage. Exploring the game. I love, love that word. Just exploring. Just exploring. That's what we're doing. Nice and easy. It's a game. Just a game. Just figuring it out. Uh, and I'm all, like, for, for me, I'm always, uh, now as an adult league guy, I'm like, okay, how do I make sure that I'm having a similar experience to my players so I'm not losing it? So I'm like, all right, I'll break down my men's league tape. One of the things I noticed was uh, like recoveries. Like, how can I get recover more pucks? And starting to like train myself to, if someone's shooting from one side, rather than maybe going net front into the traffic and where, you know, most rebounds go, it's to the far side, right? Like everyone's like far side, this far side, that. So it's like training myself to start heading towards the far side corner dot area. And my puck recoveries have gone way up. Like just exploring the game. Love it. Um, <laughs> Next thing I want to talk about here is the difference between assets and then like actually using those assets or the difference between having an asset and being effective with that asset. And, and the classic example that we can talk about here uh, is a fast player. Like everyone knows having speed is an asset. That being said, it's a completely useless asset, uh, kind of like, you know, Canadian gold. Uh, which for all our history majors, we remember back in the 1500s, uh, first ships to come to Canada were looking for gold. They brought them back in the Spanish for like these Englishmen and Frenchmen can't be that dumb to think this is actually gold, right? Uh, so same idea here, like being fast. We think we've got gold here, but maybe it's fool's gold if we're just fast all the time because that that's quite easy to defend. Uh, once you you know see it once, boom, okay, you know exactly what you need to handle. Uh, exactly where you need to be to, to make that uh, stop. Yeah, it's it's so interesting. And this, again, it's funny, we're talking about the game is the game and it, it, it's the greatest teacher. You know, it's unfortunate because fast players do the way the game is at least kind of structured still with, with still a lot of full ice early ages and things like that, at least up here in Canada. Fast players do get rewarded early. They're first to pucks, they get the puck, and they skate by players. It, it is rewarded in, in the context of the game. And it, it's unfortunate because a lot of people see value in this. Fast players get often picked more. You know, parents perceive it as, as, as more skilled, as, as better, as a higher tier of player. But almost at every level that I've worked at, a lot of my time as the skill coach or somebody involved in the skill development process, most of my time is spent with what I would consider to be an incredible north-south player in their prime and their youth but no longer or never did really learn how to play East West, how to change speeds because it was just never forced upon them. The game and the environment there, you know, the way that their individual constraints work, they were afforded the ability to kind of bypass all this extra noise and all these other things going on in the game. But then eventually that was no longer an advantage or an asset, as you put it. And it actually became the other way, truly an individual constraint where they were constrained by the way that they had developed um, and thus far. So I think it's so interesting how, again, the game teaches you. We have a player that I've been working with who I, I, I recognize as, I think, one of our best players away from the puck in finding pocket device and in presenting in space. And I, I kind of was like wondering to myself, well, how did they become that way? Because they aren't overly skilled. They don't come across as, you know, a sexy hockey player that you want on your hockey team, but they're so good at supporting the puck. And I said, well, that's just it. They aren't overly skilled. They certainly aren't fast and, and fleet of foot. So it makes sense to me that 
throughout their upbringing, they probably really had to learn how to be in good spots, probably play a little bit more passively and be the F3 every now and then and understand being open and making sure that you're managing the zone. And so what I'm getting at here is, is naturally we progress through the game with our skills, whatever they may be, which both afford us, but also in some ways, depending on the level, constrain us. And so I think the biggest injustice we do is we allow the quick players to continuously play quick and, and to be incredibly north self, incredible north self and one-on-ones. And yeah, they burn by and they get a lot of breakaways. But at some point, it's hard to tell parents, but it will catch up with them eventually. It will catch up with them eventually, right? And 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 so it's important that we change positions. It's important that we 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 change the ice and constrain them with the environment to get them to do different things. But no, it's it's such a it's such a unique conversation. I love that you're you're talking about constraining the ice to force them to find other things. And and the way I think about this is, okay, these players have never been forced to do it, so therefore they lack what I call the depth of talent. Like they or as some people call it, they don't have a B and C game. Like they just lack it and they just have one solution. Well, this is what I do. Well, sooner or later, unless you're, you know, like McDavid, uh, there's other things that are going to get in the way. People are going to catch up physically. Um, and what happens when everyone else has the same abilities and skills and we bunch all of our fast players together and no longer is being fast an asset? How do we constrain? How do we force? How do we squeeze? How do we press? And that brings us all the way back to our CLA, of course, on how we actually are developing talent. How are we developing players? How are we developing people? Uh, And I think that is the most important is challenging them right, challenging them in different ways, having them find solutions of like, how can you use your speed? Oh, I need to slow down first, then go fast. I need to draw a player in and then burn them. Uh, or my, my personal favorite with one-on-ones, we always forget about the stick, right? Like everyone's like, oh, one-on-ones, we'll keep practicing one-on-ones. Well, what are the elements that go into it? Okay, well, we need a speed differential. So draw them in and then you can use your speed. There you go. Or build it up early. And then two, we got to figure out how to defeat the stick. So now I'm having a conversation. How are you going to beat the, the def- defender stick here? Eh, maybe not going through is the answer. Maybe we just need to uh, get around and throw it out an arm. Whatever it may be, or like, okay, you need to push it into their triangle, push it out. Like finding ways to have conversations or forcing situations where you know you're going to start asking questions that's going to challenge a player. Um, and this goes into a personal belief of mine. Like, you got to coach all of your players, but coaching the top of your roster, I think, is extremely important. And a lot of people shy away from it because you know, they they can do things that the others can't or they get away. But for me, I'm I'm trying to prepare my players for the next level. And if they don't never get any coaching or it may not even be coaching, which we'll just say mentorship. They don't get any mentorship. uh, They get to a situation eventually where there's some adversity and they're lost for their wits because they just keep going back. Like, ah, here's what I do, you know, blah, blah, blah. And again, it comes back to... How do we add depth of skill to our players? How do we find ways to stretch and constrain and teach and pull things out of them rather than filling in the buckets, et cetera? Uh, it's a fascinating – it's not even a problem. It's like it's fascinating in situation to sort and wade through. Yeah, it's, and this is – I mean, this is what we're – now we're in the nitty-gritty. This is where we live, right? It's how do we truly influence behavior, especially for those players that – you know, are are really strong and adept in certain areas. And then they get to the next level and it's like they hit a ceiling, right? Those are the players that I love working with. How can we get you, you know, to get that childhood dream of getting to that one more rung on the ladder? How can we get you there? And to me, you you touch on a lot of things here and I'll try to kind of go through it um, kind of slowly. And again, always tied back into the CLA and what it does. The reason we we want the constraint led approach is because the affordances, there's opportunities for action. And so, what this is doing is again, we're still pulling kids and giving them the odd technique feedback. And when I say technique, I mean, technical, like giving them cues often with shooting, we talk about getting a good shape and getting your hands away from your body. So I'm still going to cue kids on that. It's not like I'm leaving them completely in the dark about how to do anything. Excuse me. And then as they go back into their drill, though, the drill isn't letting them necessarily shoot the same way over and over and over and over again. We're not repetition for repetition. 
now what we're trying to promote through the way we structure our drills against keeping with the theme of shooting is we want adaptability. And that is where a good dose of technique and a good dose of adaptability together, plus, you know, affordances and environmental cues, that is what becomes skill. And that is what becomes hockey IQ is you need to have it be adaptable. Does Matt Hughes have a signature shot? Of course, we know he shoots inside of his feet. We know he likes to pull it out of a curl and drag, but I'm sure he practiced in such a variety of different ways that it allows him to have a blend of adaptability with his shooting mechanics, as well as automaticity. He can do it automatically. He can do it so quick without thought because yes, there's reps in there, but no rep was exactly ever alike. So a great book on the constraint led approach that I, I encourage everybody to read is how we learn to move by Rob Gray. Um, he holds a PhD He's from Arizona state university, if I'm not mistaken, phenomenal book. If you want to do a master's program without paying the, the massive amount of money for a master's program, that would be the book that I'd first recommend. And in it, he, he talks about a story where Albert Pujols, one of the best hitters of all time, uh, I think went 0 for 3 or 0 for 6 against a um, women's uh, speedball pitcher or, um, or where they throw underhand. I believe it's, it's speedball or, or yeah, it's our, uh, softball. Softball, sorry. Thank you. Um, went 0 for 6. One of the best hitters of all time. Just hit 700 home runs. Is, is, is one of the all-time greats. And didn't have the adaptability necessary, the perception action coupling, to be able to pick up on the movement cues of that softball pitcher versus the hardball throwers that he was facing in the MLB. And so that, to me, and that's at a very high level. And sure, with more time, would he be able to figure it out? Absolutely. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to give as much information as we can to the athletes so that they know when to pull their shot into their feet to shoot, when they know to push it around and maybe shoot with a bit more reach and range. So adaptability technique together to me becomes skill. And this is why you start to see whether you want to call the constraint led approach or whether you just want to gamify or gamification, I think is another popular term that's coming up. Drill is why it's so important because they're still being pushed into the use of a skill but they're being challenged to use it in a variety of different ways, which over the long term allows them to be more adaptable in the game environment, which is that's what we need. Love that. I, I just call them coachless drills because I feel like gamifying. Yep. I feel like people nope. kind of shut off sometimes, but it's the exact same kind of concept of like, how do yeah. you remove yourself? How do you make this work better? Yeah. And you're right on like, uh, we'll host not being able to hit softball, which, you know, should, should not have any issues with that. But uh, clearly, there's, there's reasons why and exploring these are absolutely fantastic and figuring out how do we develop people and players better. So, uh, anything else you want to talk about? It's obviously been going for quite some time here. Uh, I like to try to keep these short, but this is just jam packed with goodies. Um, more just cause we're on the theme of kind of thinking of drills. I, you mentioned, you know, a North South really fast player. I just had an idea pop in my head and I said, Hey, I want to try that. So I'm going to spit all the idea out there and then we can kind of maybe, maybe call it a day from there. So, I was thinking of how would you create a drill where, you know, you have a player that's really good north south. So they're they're going to be fast up the wing, fast down the walls. Maybe you put a marking in the middle of the the offensive zone that they're entering in. So we have often ringette lines that go across the top of the circles. I don't know if that's um, everywhere, but um, so let's say you put it right in the middle of the ringette line. So you're coming down the left wing side. I would challenge that player and say, you know, with more piece it's say it's off the rush three on two how can we make sure the zone entry though occurs on the other side of the zone in between the cone and the boards there so you're coming down the left wing side how can we create the, the zone entry so yes he gained the blue but how can we gain below the tops of the circles from the right side of the rink now what do you think that player would do coming down the wall what are some things they would try yeah and the way that i would set this up is we need to change lanes so however they figure that out like change a lane or like okay You've got three lanes. You've got three repetitions. You need to find a different lane each time. Uh, you know, something Perfect. like that. And just being able to simply constrain what they can do and have them explore. You know, maybe they've just gone down and, you know, stay wide and draw in the D and your third guy high or drive wide and go to the net. Uh, Might have been their only two options. Well, now they've been forced into, okay, I can do that, but there's a whole sheet of ice we can explore here uh yep. that that would and, be my thoughts on is encouraging trying different things each time and seeing where it goes and how you know, they're going to be forced and they'll fail inevitably and helping them through that exactly. and failing forward 
And, and that's, that's it right there. And the reason I, I kind of wanted just to throw that out there was, A, it's kind of with the theme of what we've been chatting about. But that's, I think, what you and I and, and other coaches are doing. We're not thinking about it anymore with a whiteboard in our hand and, you know, okay, how can I make this go exactly how I want? It's more, okay, here's A, what maybe I see in our group or in a player, depending if you're on an individual or team level. Here's kind of what I want them to do because they think it's beneficial for them as a player. How can I construct that now? That's kind of the, the thought process and the workshopping that I've been doing lately. And I'm always looking to refine it and get better at it, but you're almost... It's funny. One of the first things I learned when I entered my master's was the quote they kind of used was begin with the end in mind. So start developing your portfolio from the first day so that you're ready at, on the last day. And that idea of begin with the end in mind is stuck with me in, in so many different areas of life and in sport. But I always start with the end in mind. What do I want the general outcome to be for our team, our group, our player? And then how can I construct backwards what I need to put them in an environment that teaches them how to do that? Phenomenal. Uh, this was an unbelievable conversation. Uh, Wade, where can people find you? Cause I feel like after this, uh, everyone should be following. Oh, well, thank you. I, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I haven't dipped my toes too much into online stuff. It's something that I'm starting to look at, maybe exploring a little bit more specifically kind of a con constraint led approach to hockey. Um, but Wade underscore Russell to S with two L's on Russell is my Twitter at. Um, right now, I, I honestly just try to retweet and share resources that I kind of believe and stand by that I've kind of read through myself. Um, and then I would also say follow the National Skill Development Association run by Dwayne Blay. Um, as he stepped with the Detroit Red Wings, he stepped away from it for a little bit, but I'm hoping to become a little bit more involved with that. And on the content creation side, I'll probably put it kind of through there and maybe even do a podcast and things like that. So that's kind of where I would start there. NSDA, uh, National Skill Development Association and at Wade Russell. Uh, at Wade underscore Russell on Twitter. But no, I really appreciate you having me on. I think it's so cool what you're doing and it's so, so valuable for people to hear kind of these perspectives. And, you know, it's, it's and I love that it's geared towards Hockey IQ because at the end of the day, that's just building good hockey players, right? Like it's, that's what we're, we're trying to do here. So I, I appreciate everything you do for the hockey community and and, and wish you nothing but the best. Man, I, I'm, I'm blushing over here. Thanks, Wade. Appreciate it. <laughs> Have a good day. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. That concludes this week's episode. Thanks for joining us here at Hockey IQ. If you haven't already, take a quick moment to hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and drop a review. If you want to be a great teammate, even recommend us to a friend. You can follow us at Hockey's Arsenal on Twitter and Instagram. Check out the website, hockeysarsenal.com, where you can subscribe to the weekly newsletter. You won't regret it. Catch a Buttes here next week for a brand new episode.